Will you turn with me to Isaiah 60, verse 21? When I was looking for a topic to present to you uh, this morning, I was wanting to show uh, through the scriptures the glory of God shown through us. And in this verse, although it was written in the Old Covenants, I found that it also can be applied to the New Covenant and the promises of the New Covenant as well. So I would like to present to you the glory of God shown through the ages and in us, ultimately um, uh, through Christ as well. Will you read with me? Thy people also shall be all righteous. They shall inherit the land forever, the branch of my planting, the work of my hands, that I may be glorified. I will, I've taken um, certain sections or passages of this verse that I would like to present to you tonight. I would go from the old to the new as well. I would like to start with the first two words, thy people. Thy denotes a possessive mentality, a form of ownership. And just as when you have something in your possession that is very valuable, you keep it and you protect it from the elements that may harm it. Well, the same is with Christ and also with God, when, with his people. He protected his people and he also kept them in him as well. Amen. They were his and only his. And he raised them up as we see through um, Genesis 15, 3 through 5, when he said that he was be giving Abraham, or Abram at that time, at least, a seed. And, Abraham, and Abram said, Behold unto me, thou hast given me no seed. And lo, one is born in, in my house, is mine heir. And behold, the word of the Lord came unto him, saying, This shall not be thine heir, but he that shall come forth out of thine own bowels shall be thine heir. And he brought him forth abroad and said, Now look towards heaven and tell the stars if thou wilt be able to number them. And he said unto him, So shall thy seed be. Later on we see Jacob who is leading Israel. And he's about to meet Esau as well. And he wrestles with an angel. And once he's done, he's impacted by that in incident that happened. Two things happened. One, he saw the face of God and lived. As he said, and God changed his name from Jacob to Israel as well. Israel means the face of God. And we know that God named his nation after the him as well. If you are named as the face of God, you need to be all righteous as well. That is my next point. The nation of Israel is called the face of God, and we know that no evil can stand in his presence. So they had to be upright and righteous before him. And the only way they could do that, or even dream to be upright and righteous before him, was through the law. Now we know that we cannot keep the law in and of ourselves. But there, are, there were some people that saw the need of the law. David, of course, is a prime example, and he wrote it in his Psalms. Psalm 3, 37, 31. And the law of his God is in his heart. None of his steps shall, shall slide. And Psalm 40, verse 8, I delight to do thy will, O my God. Yea, thy law is within my heart. And in his 119th Psalm, verse 70, I delight in thy law. And in the same chapter, verse 30, um, excuse me, same chapter, verse 97, oh, how I love thy law, is my meditation all the day. And so we see here that David saw the need of the law and loved, his, loved the law. And he, those are just four of the many instances that he wrote about. But there were also those that either neglected the law, did not see the law, or used it for their own advantage. One instance is Ur, Judas' firstborn, who was wicked in the sight of the Lord. The Lord slew him. 
In the law, there is just black and white. You either do or you don't. There is no mediator. And also Eli's son, Hophni and Phinehas, when they were taking the, the choice meats out of the sacrifices, that was in the law, but they were doing it for their own gratification, and they were abusing the law. And the Lord took care of them as well. Under the old covenant, there was no mediator between God and man. There was no such thing as grace, forgiveness, um, and compassion. Now, I have stated that um, Israel was the original seed, and it branched out, and he and they were the branch of his planting. Is my third, what I would like to discuss as my third point, and we know whatever God plants is with a purpose. He does not do anything, um, speaking as man, out of a whim. What he plants, he plants with a purpose so that it will rebound back to him as well. One prime example, of course, is Christ, or at least parts of Christ in the Old Testament. The example I would like to give is a tabernacle. Everything in the tabernacle pointed towards Christ. Uh, the mercy seat points about God's mercy and how he's merciful. And a spotless sacrifice, how Christ was the spotless sacrifice as well. And the scapegoat, of course, that the priest laid the sins of the people on the scapegoat and took it out of the camp into an uninhabited part of the camp, signifying that God would remember your sins no more. God planted Israel with a purpose, and in all the rituals and sacrifices, the purpose of those things was a point towards Christ, and this was glorious, and they glorified God in this way. Now, I would like to look at those three points in the new covenant and see how it was played out, or through um, the new covenant glasses, if I could say. Thy people, those two words no longer strictly apply to the Jewish nation. For as Galatians 3.28 states, there is neither Jew nor Greek, there is neither bond nor free, there is neither male nor female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. And we know that through 1 Peter 3.12, the eyes of the Lord are over the righteous, and his ears are open unto their prayers as well. We are all righteous as well, and we know that Israel was bound by the law to be righteous and could not keep the law in and of themselves, and thus they were judged by the law. Well, we are still judged by the law, but the death and resurrection of Christ has made our salvation possible and within our reach that we can grasp it as well. Christ did not do away with the law, but administered his spirit within our hearts so that we can keep the law and have access to the Father by the Spirit. Romans 8, 12, I mean Romans 8, 2. For the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus hath made me free from the law of sin and death. And the same chapter, verse 4, the righteousness of the law might be fulfilled in us who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. And in Galatians 5, um, 5, 18, but if ye be led of the Spirit, ye are not under the law. Ephesians 2.18 For through him we both have access by one spirit unto the Father. In the old covenant, only a few people would even dare um, go before God, such as on Mount Sinai. The people were so afraid of him, they said, you, Moses, you go first. Well, now we can come with him with boldness, as the scripture states, we, bold, we go before the throne boldly before him. And of course, the end result is, through all these, is in, stated in Ephesians 5, 27, that he might present to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that it should be holy 
and without blemish. I would like to uh, present to you for tonight, I mean, this morning, excuse, rather, the branch of my planting, how that is played out in the new uh, covenant. We understand that Israel was the original seed and branch, but, praise God, grant, branches can be grafted in. It states in Romans eleven seventeen, And if some of the branches be broken off, and thou, being a wild olive tree, were grafted in among them, and with them partakest of the root and the fatness of the olive. We were wild, condemned, and vile in the sight of God. But through Christ, we now are able to be grafted in to the promises and are not condemned, but fellow heirs as well. In Ephesians 3, 6, that the Gentiles should be fellow heirs and of the same body and partakers of his promise in Christ by the gospel. And also in Romans 8, 1, when Paul was ministering to the Romans, he stated that there is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. Well, since we are the branch of his planting, we glorify God through the Son by the fruit that we bear. Um, a verse I'm sure that you are all aware of is John uh, 15, 8. Therein is my Father glorified, that ye bear much fruit, so that ye shall be my disciples. And beforehand in the same chapter, and the fifth verse, I am the vine, and ye are the branches. He that abideth in me, and I in him, the same bringeth forth much fruit, for without me ye can do nothing. We also know that a branch that does not allow itself to be grafted in will be consumed. In John 15, verse 6, If a man abide not in me, he is cast forth as a branch and is withered, and men gather them and cast them into the fire, and they are burned. And, of course, my last point is the last five words, that I may be glorified as well. We cannot bring glory to God in and of ourselves because we have two natures within us warring against each other. We have the old man, which we have to put to death daily, and we have our new man, which is renewed day by day as well. Speaking of the old man in Romans 8, verse 5, it is fleshly, for they that are after the flesh do mind the things of the flesh. And also in verse 8, so then they that are in the flesh cannot please God. We, the flesh does not in any wise want to bring glory to God the Father, because it's very selfish and it wants just to gratify itself. But praise be to God, we have... Uh, actually, praise be to God and Christ, we have, um, n we are not able to have this new nature, his spirit that's dwelling in us. For in R Romans 8, 9, is a wonderful affirmation. But ye, are not in, but ye are not in the flesh, but in the spirit, so that, be the, so that the spirit of God dwell in you. Well, this was all, the new man was made possible by the death and the resurrection of Christ when he had the sins of the world cast upon him, which I think must have been a devastating blow to Christ, who was beforehand, when he had the sins of the world, as John states, was in the bosom of the Father. He was as close as any of us could have gotten to God. And when the Father turned his back on him, uh, I'm sure that on the flesh that must have been a devastating blow towards Christ. But um, we, we know that sin cannot stand in the presence of God. So therefore he had to have turned his back on Christ. But after Jesus ascended to the right hand of the Father and was glorified, his Father was also glorified as well. Therefore when we glorify Christ, we glorify God as well. For in John 14, 13, And whatsoever ye shall ask in my name, 
that will I do, that the Father may be glorified in the Son. And 2 Thessalonians 1.12, that the name of our Lord Jesus Christ may be glorified in you, and ye in him, according to the grace of our God and the Lord Jesus Christ. And 1 Peter 4.11 says that God in all things may be glorified through Jesus Christ, to whom praise and dominion forever and ever. Amen. In conclusion, when I was meditating on these verses, it struck me that it's only through Christ that we can glorify God. And it's not of ourselves, but of him as well.